Today, on Building on the Block, we have DC Builder. He's an incredibly talented and smart research engineer, working at WorldCoin, an open source protocol that uses biometrics to create a proof of identity without revealing any of your personal information. He previously worked as a crypto researcher and technical writer at Morales, which is an API platform for blockchain data. He's currently a contributor on EIP4844, which is the proto dank sharding Ethereum improvement proposal, a proposal designed to help Ethereum scale. He's incredibly curious, devoted to knowledge, and passionate about his work. And now, the interview with DC Builder. Hey, DC Builder, thanks for coming on. Uh, very much appreciate you being here. Hello, hello, thanks for having me. Let's start with this question. So Vitalik never wrote the Ethereum white paper. Do you think Ethereum would be where it would be today or do you think we would have another protocol like ethereum on the blockchain yeah I, i'm pretty sure there would be actually um there was a bunch of people early on that were um sort of mad at the non-programmability and like the, the the rigidness of bitcoin where um there was like this war against like big blockers and small blockers and like it, it resulted in a bunch of forks of bitcoin uh, but like there, there were many people that were interested in sort of having extra programmability, uh, but the virtual machine of Bitcoin um, just doesn't support this. Uh, you can only like write trivial scripts uh, using Bitcoin script, and that's pretty much it. There's not support for, for more elaborate opcodes, and certainly not for a true and complete language. So I feel like it would have emerged in either way. Um, and like Vitalik was one of like 15 co-founders as well, but he, he paved the way in the in terms of like cryptography, early consensus um, sort of things. And yeah, just like overall, like helped bootstrap the network and played a huge role. Um, but there were many people as well that were interested at the same time. Yeah, I, I sort of agree with you on that. Um, I, I, I do think that eventually we would have went down the same path where people would have identified mm -hmm. additional use cases um, just because you know, just the, the, the Bitcoin prominence wasn't, um, it just wasn't where we needed to be from an economic standpoint and from a standpoint where um, we could use this kind of new decentralized currency, decentralized model um, in a way that we can build out um, different types of protocols and use cases from that. Um, so mm -hmm. I think eventually somebody would have um, created something similar to Ethereum. Mm -hmm. But I'm really happy that Vitalik came along because, like, it's not only about the technology itself; it's also about the values, uh, and like yeah. he really embodies the, the crypto ethos really well, um, and like builds for people instead of just like trying to compromise on some values. So I feel like that's that's really good. Yeah, he he really truly is almost like 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 a godsend because you know <laughs> yeah. we 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 could we, we we could have had anybody else, um, and Charles Hoskinson could have said, stayed the CEO of, of Ethereum and. That could have been really bad just because it probably would have been a private company and nothing against Charles um, and nothing against, you know, making money. But um, for just Ethereum values, I think that would have been bad and we just wouldn't have been where we were today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, there's a good book on this uh, by Lara Shin. I cannot remember the name, but uh, I think you can just look it up. I think it's either Cryptopian to one of these books, um, like early Ethereum history. I forget the name. I'm blanking out. Yeah, yeah Cryptopians I have not read. Um, I definitely need to get to that one. Mm -hmm. um, so for, for haters of crypto and centralization, what kind of use cases do you think would not be possible without Ethereum and smart contracts that are solving some of the biggest problems today? I mean, it's the, there's the, 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 the usual, right? Like there's the financial use cases, which, which most people are aware of. Um, uh, I feel like finance works until it doesn't, right? Uh, until people have like a true issue with it uh, or like just plainly don't have access to it um just censor like some, something you cannot censor right like finance that you cannot censor something that's really powerful like if you're in a country that just doesn't have banks like third world country or if you're in a totalitarian regime and you want to use some services that you don't have access to i believe that like the centralized blockchains allow you to to get access to these primitives even if you're if you're uh, like in, it's a, if, even if it's impossible for you to get them otherwise um, so that, that I feel like would have never existed without these things, no matter how much you, you hate, like the state of things, um, like there's things like just, just trustless protocols in general, in which you don't have to depend on a trusted, uh, intermediary to, to get done a specific thing. Um, so we mentioned finance, like lending exchange, um, things like that, yield aggregation. Um, then there's, uh, of course, like permissionless or 
um, donations you cannot censor, essentially. Right? So like protocols like Gitcoin, where anybody can support anyone with any intermediaries. You don't have to do like um, donations through like an LLC or like to a nonprofit or, or anything. Uh, it's, it's very simple. Um, I guess remittance, the basic one, right? Like anybody can do payments anywhere in the world in a matter of seconds with almost instant finality. And there's nobody that can stop you. There's nobody that takes like egregious fees. Um, there's no Western Union type player in the, in the middle of it. This is like plain of like a lot of these use cases. Um, and it also allows for both more, more transparency and more, more privacy at the same time. Um, you can just use different cryptographic primitives and put them together in different ways to either make some, something like finance more private and also more, 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 more trustless and more transparent. It depends on how you sort of enforce the rules inside of a protocol which, which I, f I feel like wouldn't have ever been able to be to, to exist in the traditional world because it's everything about like trust between humans and some authority like setting who's trustworthy and who's not. Like a SWIFT based system, which is obviously mm -hmm. broken. Yeah. And what was your motivation bet behind getting into uh, Ethereum and blockchain um, and becoming a researcher um, at WorldCoin as well as all of the other things that you're doing? Hmm. Yeah, so early on, it was mostly just plain curiosity. I was, I, I got into crypto like at the end of 2017, beginning of 2018. So like peak of the bubble of the bull market, of the last bull market. Um, and uh, it was mostly curiosity because like I was 17 at the time. I was in high school and I just like, my, my dad always told me like, like you should probably learn something about finance and like how money works because it's a useful skill to have. And uh, I was learning math at the time for um, like some other interests that I have. I was really curious about like machine learning and stuff. And in order to understand machine learning, you need to know a bunch of math. And so like I started going down the rabbit hole of learning uh, different like math courses, like linear algebra or like calculus. And I I was a big fan of a of a channel on YouTube called Three Blonde Brown, which just like creates illust like illustration videos or like videos about I mathematical ideas and creates amazing graphics and like illustrations and like, what, what gives is the you channel the intuition. Called? Uh, three blue, one brown. Three blue, one brown. I gotta yeah, check it, that out. Huh. It's, it's a really cool channel. And he made a video, uh, Grant Sanderson, he made a video about um, Bitcoin and how it works from like a very simple um, first principles, like cryptography, hashing functions, uh, like just the, the problem that Bitcoin is solving, like the Byzantine's general problem and a bunch of things around that. And that was like my first ever sort of um, me being exposed to crypto. And from there, I thought like, oh, this is cool. Let me read some more. And so I started going down the rabbit hole, learning about Bitcoin, like about monetary systems, just like the Fed, just like how traditional money works. And then why Bitcoin like solves certain problems. And then like the natural progression is like from Bitcoin, then you like learn like about Ethereum and then you can do programs with money and then you can do like at the time there was just barely anything like there was the only DeFi um, app that I knew was um, two, two, two of them actually. One was Ether Delta, which was like a primitive, primitive decentralized exchange. And the other one was uh, MakerDAO's uh, stablecoin, but it was a single collateral stablecoin. It was called Psy at the time. There was no DAI yet. Mm -hmm. And... And yeah, like, so it was something that was like more in the, like on the back of my mind. I was still like doing AI most of the time, but then like around early 2020, like a bunch of crazy things started happening. I, I listened to Bankless since like the first episode, the Bankless podcast, and it, it really helped me like get the first idea of like where this could go. Um, like, you know, like the compound launched their, their lending protocol, they launched the token and then like. Once the bull market got kicked, just like a bunch of things happens. Like um, Aave had just rebranded from Ethland to Aave and like they launched their token. Like all of these people like started launching protocols, Uniswap, then like the, the vampire attack from SushiSwap to Uniswap, like all these things, crazy things started happening. And since I was a student, like I was like, okay, this is interesting. People are like getting airdrops. People are like doing a bunch of like cool financial activities on chain. Let me learn more about this and participate in this. And yeah, that's, I guess, like how I got started. Yeah, it's very interesting that you say that. Um, I, w I actually had a finance degree um, when I graduated from the Univers University of Illinois, Chicago, but I didn't end up going into finance. My last six months of university, I kind of just got into tech, but I was still trading. Um, and I ended up like losing all my money just, just trading because it was gambling. And I was like, okay, technology is 
the natural progression for somebody to trade so that we don't have to kind of use our emotions um, mm -hmm. and make these type of mistakes. So I accidentally got into tech, but then when I saw DeFi for the first time, it blew my mind. And I was like, this is the new financial revolution. And everything I was doing at that point, we were running the data company, but I knew that we had it to get into um, into smart contracts, blockchain, um, and DeFi, because this is where the world is going. Because now you have basically the whole financial system being um, completely redone through these decentralized primitives. And that to me was something that I think, you know, really kind of changed, changed my life, which is seeing that, that one day. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's very interesting that you say that. Yeah, I had a similar, similar upcoming in this space. But I, I started more mm -hmm. of as a researcher. Uh, I was just like curious and learned. And the way that I got yeah. into the space is that I wrote technical articles for, uh, um, for actually one of the, one of the like crypto YouTubers. Um, his name is Avan on tech. And now he leads a company called Morales, Morales, which is building like, yeah, he's building like Web3 development tooling. But early on, I was just like, okay, like what, what, what kind of job could I get in this space? And Ivan was looking for a, a tech writer, essentially, like, or like a crypto writer. So I, I, I used the opportunity to um, like write technical articles to learn more about the space and make some money at the time because like i come from the czech republic and the, the average salary is just like really bad especially for students right it's like something like in the order of five to six dollars an hour and that's okay like six to seven is like you're doing good <laughs> and so like if, if 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 i can find a job that pays like three times as much and uh like helps me learn something that i'm more passionate about then i'm all for it so that's sort of like how i got started in the space but then but i got more into like development from? a czech republic Oh, Czech Republic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm originally from Belarus, so I definitely understand that the average salaries over there yeah. are two hundred dollars. Um, so it's it's yep. a totally different world when you can start making ten times that, and yeah, you yeah, can yeah. start kind of giving back to your family, and mm -hmm. they're like, "Wow, this is, this is real money." Yeah, it's a it's an interesting background that you have because um, when when I was reading about Vitalik's bio, um, he had a very similar kind of upcoming as right working as a um, as a technical writer, and I think that's how he became um, so articulate and so knowledgeable about um, explaining these different concepts, um, very, very, uh, very complicated concepts in a simple format. Um, and were you always technical? When did you start um, development? When did you start kind of exploring mm -hmm. software um, yeah. and code? The the first time that I ever got like curious about coding in general was when I was like fourteen ish. Uh, I was just like in the last year of what we, we call it primary school, but uh, I guess like US uh, listeners would call it uh, middle school. So like ninth grade. Um, and uh, in ninth grade, we had an IT class and our teacher just showed us like HTML, CSS and JavaScript. And we built like a simple website using HTML and CSS. And then I found it like really curious, but I, I knew that like I was using things like Facebook right? Like at the time, like 2015. And I'm like, okay, so this is built using this, but like what, what he showed me, like what the teacher showed me wasn't like too, too, too advanced. So I was like, the, the, the gotta be more. And so I found freecodecamp.org or .com online. And it's, it's essentially a website that teaches you how to build websites um, using this like interact, interactive um, code editor where you write some HTML, CSS, JavaScript code. And then on the right, you see the rendered website with the, with the full capabilities that you've mm -hmm. programmed in it. And that's sort of like how I got started. Then I did like CS50, which is a, a course that's publicly available to everybody done by Harvard. Harvard. It's a computer science, int intro to computer science course. So that's how I learned like about computers for the first time. And then it's just like going down the rabbit hole, which is like watching different videos on YouTube, like what's 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 out there in computer science, what's there to doing in tech. And then I got built um, like by AIML and just like continued learning, which is like my curiosity mostly drove me to learn the things that I learned. It's, it seemed that it seems like most people in the tech space are driven by curiosity. I mean, most entrepreneurs are driven by curiosity in general, and that curiosity is never ending. And that's why I feel like you know, true entrepreneurs will never get tired of quote unquote working because there's always something new to be discovered and something new to learn. 
Um, and I find myself like getting involved in topics that you know that I never imagined in a million years I'd be in. But <laughs> but you're, yeah. you're just going going down the rabbit holes of articles, and then you see yourself reading about like how how to build robots, and I'm like, okay, this is interesting, and you know, mm-hmm. you never know just what what you're going to be involved <laughs> in from that. Yeah, I don't know where I'm going to be in ten years um, either. Right, so like a lot of things can change. It's really fun. Speaking about ten years, what's your craziest prediction for AI in the next ten years? I mean, um, I've haven't kept much, uh, kept up much with AI, uh, but I have a good friend. His name is Miguel uh, at M One Gel PF Miguel Piedrafita on Twitter, and he's been recently building like a lot of apps using AI. So like, I'm sort of aware of what's out there, like large language models like ChatGPT or or GPT in general, GPT three, or just like stable diffusion with like some video prompts and stuff. Um, like for me, I think like large language models will be a tool that allow users or just humans in general to um, up their capabilities by at least like 10 to 50 fold in the coming 10 years. Just like the ability to be able to uh, have an interface for the internet that's a lot more human friendly. Like instead of Googling and like going down the link and then like trying to find where in the website the, your, like your, the information is there. It's just you, you're talking to this large language model that like creates a nice background from whatever your understand, current understanding is and take you to the to the level where you want to understand a specific topic, it just like breaks it down. If you don't understand something, um, they'll like break it down to, to the constituents and like explain everything from first principles. And if you want like code examples for a specific thing, like an implementation of a hashing function, and then like, oh, that's how it works, right? Like it, it's, just, it's just a great way for learning and also like for building things. Um, like I, I myself use uh, GitHub Copilot, right? It's a tool that allows you to essentially predict the code that you're gonna write. So if, if I get some form of description using either comments or like a function signature, then it will like try to implement the specific thing that you're doing. So now, for example, if I'm writing like Solidity contracts, um, then it just autocompletes a bunch of the, the function description or or like it, it like makes like the repetitive parts of coding really easy and trivial because you just tab, you press the tab and it just fills the code that you're trying to write. And maybe you make like a few adjustments to it. It helps me debug stuff uh, as well, or ha- helps me explain pieces of code that somebody else has written. It's really useful. And, and this is just like the early days of it. So in 10 years, I feel like it's really gonna boost human productivity, whether it's for, for jobs like development, like, like web development or like any coding form or just like jobs in general, right? Like you have robotics, you, you can see like the latest videos from Boston Dynamics where you have this robot that's like carrying a, a tool case and like brings it to the to the worker. Or there's like a, a million. Flips. Yeah, doing backflips or side flips <laughs> is just insane. It's just so many crazy things, so many crazy use cases that I find this is gonna be insane in 10 years. I, I really cannot predict on such a time frame, but I feel like it's gonna be a, hu- it's gonna be a huge impact on humanity. Yeah, I, th- I think AI will definitely change the way that everything is structured and the way that, you know, resources are being used. And I think as human beings, we're naturally resourceful, um, but a lot of human beings, they kind of just get complacent and with the current things that are around them. But I think in this kind of society, you can't get complacent. You always have to be learning. You always have to be challenging yourself. Um, And unfortunately, AI will replace a lot of jobs. However, mm-hmm. you know, as humans, you know, we adapt to change and um, I think we just need to learn new skill sets. And what ChatGPT has shown is, yeah, there will probably be a lot of replacements for jobs. However, if you are resourceful and you can use that to your advantage and you can start understanding how ChatGPT works and some of these other AI software work, then it can make your life a lot easier. You know, mm-hmm. you don't have to write long articles anymore. Now you can do all of the necessary research um, and you can create the necessary inputs for chat gpt to help you write those articles and alleviate some of your time you can use chat gpt to generate you know logos and branding for for your company you can use um, other ai software to even generate designs for your website right so a lot of these things that are just taking a lot of time um, out of our daily lives um, we can, you know, we can use to the best of our ability to alleviate some of those time pressures and use the human creativity to um, to spawn these kind of new ideas that are actually going to make an impact rather than mm-hmm. um, making us do these um, these more mundane tasks. I definitely agree, for sure. H- how do you think AI will impact the blockchain? 
for me, I don't really see a straightforward um, sort of link right now. It's just too too unclear. Like many people try to shoehorn AI into blockchain just because it's like two two buzzwords you can put together and probably raise against just those two words in a pitch deck. But I don't see a straightforward use case at the moment. There's a few like experiments of like having AI on chain to do some form of like credit scoring or just like scoring um like based on some inputs, right? So if I if I want to maybe say like all how good a person is uh, like I don't know at finance, right? Or like at trading, you can take a bunch of like information from their trading history, put it into an AI model, and then maybe like map it to some output. Um, and that that could, like could be something you can do on, like with on-chain AI, but I don't really feel it's going to impact it anytime soon. And when it does, it's going to look a lot different than it does now. So I feel like I feel like there's no straightforward use case. But there are some like reverse use cases of like where where sort of cryptography or like blockchain tech in general is applicable to AI. Um, there's there's like if you want to do like private AI, you can use techniques like fully homomorphic encryption, um, which is a type of encryption that allows you to perform operations on private data. And when you decrypt it, the decrypted data will have like um, will be like the result of running some transformations on the input, but you'll never have access to the actual input. Um, so it's it's a really nice way of like doing private training or like private inference. Um, then there's like some things that I'm interested in, which is uh, zero knowledge machine learning, which is using zero knowledge uh, cryptography to prove that you ran some model on some data and you got some output from it, right? So there'll be a future when like a lot of Twitter accounts will just be AI bots and they'll like give you the news or whatever. And if you want to actually prove that this was created using a, a large language machine learning model, um, a specific one on some input data, uh, and there's nothing like done badly about it, then that's a use case. There's a bunch of others, but yeah, I feel like there, there's more, more use cases in the reverse direction because cryptography allows you to build like more interesting protocols and just like do like privacy primitives or like validation of some 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 computation or or just like make something private something visible to some people just like restrict access have some roles between the protocol and th those are like more flexible tools than ai itself i feel like at least right now yeah i, I definitely sort of agree with with the first part of, of what you mentioned i mean i think ai is going to be useful in a lot of the um, processing of on-chain data um, in order for us to understand and predict things a little bit better and um, like on-chain credentials, for example, if, you know, you know, if somebody has, you know, a certain history on-chain, we can allow them to access a certain amount of capital with the actions that they have done. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, you know, there's many different ways that are applicable the same way that we're using AI today um, to use AI in the blockchain. In terms of a direct impact on the blockchain, I'm not exactly sure what that's going to look like. Um, I think maybe it'll help consumers understand it a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. and kind of use it a little bit better. But um, besides that, yeah, I don't, I don't really see like a direct correlation with that. Yeah, I, I feel like AI is going to have a lot of second order effects on blockchain. You know, like I'm a blockchain developer myself or like researcher, cryptographer, whatever. And like just the, the tooling that AI brings you speeds, speeds the development process for blockchain developers a lot. And for example, in the future, you can maybe train an AI to do an audit of some Solidity contract. And it will find the like the most trivial vulnerabilities. Maybe like there are some things that will want, but for the time being, it's already like starting to to be helpful in in a lot of these use cases. Um, and in general, like I feel like AI is going to create so much value that blockchain feels just like the natural progression um, to distribute this value on. Right? Like if if AI replaces a lot of jobs, it will still create a lot of value for humanity. And you will still want to have mechanisms in which you can distribute this value equitably across like different people. And that's like sort of like one of the long-term visions of why, like, so I sort of like joined Worldcoin, where like this is part of the long-term vision where AI cr creates insane amounts of value, and you have this financial network or of users um, that have some form of digital uniqueness where you can distribute this value across of, and there might be a future where society might get disrupted in a way where people wouldn't have to work for for sustenance but they might work just for pleasure or for other reasons yeah and i think you mentioned something extremely interesting and important um, i think ai is incredibly great at um, helping manage risk and um, with 
the primitives with blockchain, um, such as DeFi, um, I think managing risk is one of the important, most important components um, on blockchain. So I think it'll help you know insurance companies, it'll help treasuries um, manage some of their funds um, and kind of eliminate some of the risks associated um, with you know potentially just the way that DeFi protocols work. Um, Etc. So I, I think that there's definitely a um, that's 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 one of the great use cases of AI um, with blockchain. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned Worldcoin, um, and I did a little bit of research on Worldcoin. I find it incredibly interesting. Can you talk about Worldcoin and the contributions that you're making there, and what it is, and what Worldcoin is uh, trying to do? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So th- there's a few different tricks on like what Worldcoin is trying to achieve. Um, I feel like the m- the most public facing one right now is mostly our privacy preserving proof of personhood protocol. Um, so let me break that down. We're, we're trying to create sort of a, a cryptographic uh, protocol that allows you to um, sort of make sure that somebody is unique online or just anywhere. And we do this using biometrics um, <clears throat> in which we have a custom uh, biometric imaging device. We call it the orb. And it has a, a camera, it has a bunch of sensors, it has a computer built in. I actually have it right here. I can show you over the over the camera. That would be great. Looks like this. Right? Uh, it's, cool. uh, for, for, the, for the listeners out there, it's just like a round ball with a, an iris camera um, in the middle. Oh, you can Google it. You can probably find pictures of it online. And what it does, it essentially takes a, an image of a person's face. And uh, locally on the device, it computes um, a unique identifier using machine learning. And this identifier, um, or we we call it the iris code, um, it essentially has a representation of the iris, which has no um, like private, uh, privately identifiable information, publicly identifiable information. There's there's no PII on it, and uh, essentially. The, the property of this this identifier is that you cannot um, use it to um, to get the original image. It's not sort of like hard cryptographically. Um, there's not like a cryptographically hard property that makes it so, but it's just like a lot of compression. Um, and the when you have this RS code, um, you put it inside of a Merkle tree, which is just the data structure. And then using zero knowledge cryptography, um, you are able to take this RS code and along with an action that you're trying to perform, which um, essentially you can think of it like, let's say you're voting inside of a blockchain protocol, let's say snapshot, uh, which is an off-chain voting protocol. And you can take uh, a snapshot vote and uh, a unique iris code, and you can cryptographically sign uh, inside of a zero knowledge proof that this person is unique and they haven't voted for this specific proposal. Uh, And you can do this completely privately. Also, a thing that I forgot to mention is like once the um, we don't collect biometric information unless um, you explicitly um, give out that information when you're signing up, and um, the the orb itself once you generate the iris code, um, you, it deletes the image locally. So it never leaves the orb unless explicitly agreed upon by the user. And so once once you have sort of this iris code, you're able to make private attestations on uniqueness without revealing any of your actions that you're doing to anybody else. Um, so it's completely private in this sense. The, the the ID itself or the iris code that's associated with the Vulcan wallet that you have uh, is not associated with any actions that you're doing. So if you're like doing private voting or if you're like uh, getting a private airdrop, nobody knows which specific iris code that action belongs to, thanks to zero knowledge cryptography. And is the orb something that is absolutely necessary? Is there no way to do mm-hmm. these kind of computations on a local device um, that I take a picture from my camera, it calculates, it takes my biometrics, um, stores it in the way that you're talking about in uh, creates mm-hmm. into zero knowledge proof, et cetera, et cetera. Is, is there no way to do that or is the, the orb absolutely necessary? Uh, that's a great question, actually. Uh, when we started WorldCoin, we uh, or like when, when the company got started, I joined a lot later. Uh, when the company got started, uh, Worldcoin didn't really want to build custom hardware because first of all, it's expensive, it's hard to scale. Uh, there's like a lot of issues with it. Um, the reason for using biometrics in the first place is just because it's the is the only solution to to civil resistance at, at a scalable way and also in an inclusive way. Um, 
uh, biometrics are useful um, because they're able to sort of they, they embody this sort of like property of uniqueness. Uh, right, uh, the the human iris is so unique that even if you have like a hundred billion people, um, the the probability of there being a collision uh, between two different human irises is is so negligible that it's a really scalable protocol, and it's also really inclusive because um, most people on Earth have hum human irises or just like irises in general. Uh, unlike things like KYC, right? Like if you want to do a KYC route, most people don't have IDs. Like there's half of, half of the world's population or so doesn't have. An ID right, or of any sort, like passport or ID, and wow. and and on top of that, like KYC is just very very privacy uh, violating. It's the complete opposite of privacy preserving, in which like things like the biometric uh, approach is it can be built in a way that's privacy preserving, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we recently open sourced the Orb hardware. We open sourced it um, last Friday, so if you go to the Worldcoin blog, which is worldcoin.org/blog and click on the latest article you can read more on like why we chose biometrics our, our privacy policy like how we approach privacy um just like the license that we have which restricts uh, our technology to be used for any um any sort of acts again violating human rights such as like privacy and things like that so we don't want our technology to be used for like um essentially like authoritarian regimes where they're using it to tracking people and like things like that um so you can read a lot more on, on, on that, on the blog, blog post. So, so I guess the answer to the question is the orb is necessary as of mm -hmm. today. Yeah, um, I, I forgot and, about that. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so... and, the, and the reason, the reason why I asked that is, you know, th that's a pretty big piece of hardware. Um, so mm -hmm. for that to scale to a billion people, we would need a billion orbs. Um, is there no way to do that from, uh, from your iPhone, from your Android through yes. an application, which is fully private? Yeah, I, I forgot to answer that. Um, it's uh, the reason why we have a custom um, imaging device is mostly because of resolution and because of fraud prevention. Uh, things like Face ID, which many people are aware of, because they mo many people have an iPhone or an Android phone, which has like a form of facial identification, is because these these protocols are the resolution is very low, and the the probability of having a clash is in between like one in five million to one in ten million, which means that for every ten million there is a collision between two users. So the same two people who could unlock the same phone, even if they're different people and they, they both use the different way, like they, they scan their eyes and like it just clashes for the same person. And this is a property of the camera not having enough resolution. And then there's other properties. Um, so Worldcoin is trying to solve this problem of civil resistance in which you're able to attack a system that depends on uniqueness, right? If If you want to make a voting protocol, it's really important for you to know that each voter is unique Otherwise, a person might be creating thousands of identities and voting to sway the, the outcome in, in any different way. And so these, these sorts of attacks where you have a protocol that's dependent on uniqueness um, and you have like attacks uh, that try to sort of game this uniqueness are called civil attacks. And uh, in turn, um, sort of like the, the mechanisms that are built to prevent this are called civil resistant mechanisms. And so in order to solve civil resistance, uh, you need one thing, which is like the resolution and being able to create this in the first place. But the other one is just some like fraud prevention mechanisms so that you're ensuring that no sign up is duplicate. And so the, the orb itself has a bunch of sensors which sort of make sure that the person is not wearing like contact lenses that like might change your pattern of the iris or that gla or they're not wearing glasses or that they're human in general, right? Like you don't, you're not putting an animal in front of it or, or different things like that. So it essentially checks that a human person that's live um, has a specific biometric information and that they haven't scanned again. Because when the orb generates the iris code, it checks against the database of all iris codes, which is inside of a smart contract. It compares them. And if the iris codes uh, are the same, then it just doesn't insert it into the database. And it has a clash, right? Like this person has already signed up. That's what ensures um, cyber resistance. And in order to... Yeah, in order to have enough resolution to be able to determine that a person is indeed unique, you need custom hardware uh, nowadays. But we're, we're making open source. We're eventually open sourcing everything else about the Orb, not only the hardware, so that people can build their own, so that they can essentially have a valid Orb and operate on the WorldCoin protocol without it being um, like 
part of the original team that made WorldCoin. Can the orb detect the difference between identical twins? Yes, identical twins do not have identical irises. And the reason why I ask this is my, my business partner has an identical twin. And whenever, <laughs> when, whenever he flies from Canada to the United States, um, they actually get flagged when they go through the biometric detection. Um, and they always tell him, hey, you've already been through here. And he's like, no, that's my brother. <laughs> and they, they always stop them there. So it's um, it's an interesting question um, that you guys you guys are solving because even even the government uh, protocols aren't uh, aren't able mm -hmm. to distinguish between twins right now. Yeah, we, we did a lot of innovations on top of the state of the art for for biometrics in general. We have a great AI team and just biometrics team in general. And do you think eventually we'll be in a place where we can use native functionality from iOS or Android to be able to do biometric detection? I mean, the way for me, now? I feel like that's a, a question that's a bit out of my depth. I'm not really knowledgeable enough about like optics or just AI and biometrics in general to be able to answer uh, this question. That would be more of like a question for, for the rest of my team, but I, I hope so. Uh, I certainly hope so. Uh, the, the less expensive it becomes and the more accessible it becomes, the more inclusive it becomes and the faster you can scale. So it's beneficiary for everybody else. And, and last question on, on WorldCoin. Um, I saw that you guys have managed to acquire 870,000 users, which is absolutely incredible. Um, does this mean that there is 870,000 users that have scanned their biometrics using the orb? Um, how did you guys get to that scale and how do you incentivize people to sign up and use it? There must be mm -hmm. some kind of incentivization structure uh, in order mm -hmm. for people yep. to, to sign up and to get to that level of scale. Yeah, so so uh, that, that number is a little bit out of date. Um, the current number, you can find it on the website. It's, if you go to worldcoin.org, you can see the number. Right now, it's about 1.1 million people. Um, we crossed the 1 million mark a few weeks ago. And Congratulations. the... Thank you, thank you. It's a, it's a, I'm really proud of the team. And uh, the way that we achieve this, we're currently in a beta program, so we haven't really been all, very public, and like the, there's not like a lot of marketing or like there's not just like any public available information. So the only way that that we've like achieved this is through like um, beta testing the orbs. Essentially, we 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 we're, we're we're in beta right now as a company because we haven't launched uh, or as a project we haven't launched. Um, the token yet and a lot of the things have been just mostly like testing and just like trying to to make the technology robust enough uh, make it secure make it scalable uh, make orbs um at a scale right so like we have a manufacturing pipeline and we're making it more scalable in which you can do mass production for orbs and distribute them to more places so the the way that they have been signed up to date is just with having physical people operating the orb and scanning people in 29 different countries, in over 29 different countries all around the, the world in five different continents. And the way that it works is that uh, there's an incentive program uh, program for both uh, orb operators and users. So orb operators get a reward for each person that um, they scan. And um, people that signed up, they get um, four things right now. They get the WorldCoin token airdrop, uh, but right now it's an IOU. The WorldCoin token is not launched. There's no like liquid supply. Uh, it's just an IOU for like when there is a launch, then the the, to the 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 test tokens will be converted to the real tokens. And then the 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 other things that we do is that we give them USDC, um, Bitcoin, and ETH, um, ETH tokens on Polygon POS. So what we do is we we launch a Gnosis Safe uh, wallet on Polygon POS. And the user claims sort of these drops, we call them, where they, they complete uh, a lesson to learn how like ETH, Bitcoin, and, and DAI works. And now we're replacing DAI with USDC, how they work and how to use them. And the app allows them to buy and sell crypto, to transfer crypto. It's a self-custodial wallet, just like any other. And uh, it essentially, like when you get onboarded onto WorldCoin, you get the world ID, which is the the sort of the iris code that allows you to make cryptographic attestations of, about your uniqueness and then they get the wallet where they get these drops and so that's like the incentive for the users both having world id these drops and just like a crypto wallet that allows you to do remittance or buying and selling exchanging assets and and yeah uh and the orb operators get the incentives from us um and this is coming from a consumer and from an orb operator um, what mm -hmm. can I get as an orb operator for operating one of these orbs? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the orb operators get a reward based upon the, the sort of median income of that specific country. And there's like a review process um, in which we select which operators sort of they apply and then we review the applications, we accept some of them, and then we send out orbs to those applicants. And they essentially are like business owners at that point where they get orbs and they run a business which is scanning people and they receive rewards based on each sign up. So each uh, sort of user sign up has a cost of acquisition for us. One is the orb operator reward, and the second one is the user reward that's in the form of drops that they receive in their crypto wallet. And so, yeah, for the user, the incentive is they get a little bit of crypto and altcoin tokens. And eventually, like if any app wants to do airdrops uh, in a private civil resistant way, then they can do so through altcoin as well. So there's like a different way. So like distributing tokens and like if, if there's like a token, like oh, want to launch a token to every single person out there, then they can use the the graph of altcoin users to instantly distribute to anyone. And and yeah, that was like the sort of the incentive. Our operator gets a reward from us, and the the users get rewards from us in the form of tokens. Got it. Yeah, that's pretty incredible, um, especially. I mean, I saw some of the use cases of, of WorldCoin, and I, I do think there is a massive need for something like WorldCoin so that there isn't um, the same person signing up four times um, in order just to receive an airdrop mm -hmm. um, in whatever other cases may be. So I think 100%, um, especially when it comes to um, voting and politics, I think something like WorldCoin is absolutely needed. Yeah, well, I don't know about those use cases, a bit too early to say, um, but I'm sure that like the technology is a really good primitive to solve those those problems. Absolutely, at least it's a good example um, in today's day and age on what can be done um, with biometrics. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Ethereum. Um, you obviously love Ethereum, I love Ethereum. Um, can you talk a little bit about EIP 4844? Um, can you explain protodank sharding and why it's important for Ethereum scaling? Um, how Ethereum works right now and what will EIP 4844 change? Sure. Um, so for those who don't know or like who don't really like listen to what was happening in, in Ethereum core land, there's this problem on Ethereum where if you've ever been a user of Ethereum, you've probably noticed this, where in times of high demand, the, the gas prices or the price of submitting a transaction or using the network uh, is really high. And this is because there is a limited amount of, of, of block space on the network. There's a limited amount of sort of execution that you can do on the network. And since there's many people, like there's millions of users that try to use the network. Then there's an actual like auction mechanism in which people pay uh, money to get their transactions included into the network. And when there is a big demand for it, this price spikes. Of course, if you want to build a scalable network that um, is um, accessible towards anybody and uh, wants to be uh, cheap enough so that anyone anywhere around the world can use it for, for DeFi or for anything else, then you need to scale the network. And EIP 4844 is, is targeted towards that. EIP stands for Ethereum Improvement Proposal, and 4844 is just the number that's assigned to it. Uh, the name of it, it's protodank sharding. Um, it's not a really descriptive name, but what essentially what it essentially does is that it creates a separate uh, storage uh, space on Ethereum, so all Ethereum nodes um, would have all execution Ethereum nodes would have a separate storage space for um, this thing that we call blobs. Um, you can think of blobs just like a, as, a, as a small little database um, that people can post data to. And this data has a specific format in which um, there's these scal scalability solutions on top of Ethereum called rollups. They, they essentially, there's two types of rollups. Uh, one of them is called an optimistic rollup, and the other one is a zero-knowledge rollup. The optimistic rollup works in a way where we have a separate network with a separate execution layer, and you 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 do transactions on this network, unlike any other network. Um, the two most popular ones are Arbitrum and Optimism, and these networks um, sort of have these transitions, like these these transactions on them. Sorry, and after these transactions happen, there's this think or there's this um, sort of um, entity called the fraud prover and this fraud prover goes over the, the, the these transactions or more formally these state transitions where the blockchain uh, whether it's optimism or theorem they go to these state transitions in which 
um, the blockchain goes from state A to state A plus one. Like, right, like if, if right now, let's say that I have like 10 ETH and if I sell one ETH, then I have nine ETH. So like the current state is that I have 10 ETH and in the next block, the state is that I have nine ETH. And so these fraud provers go through all of the set of transactions and these in these blockchains and check whether there's no invalid state transitions happening. And once um, a period of um, sort of uh, seven days in which uh, these fraud provers can um, find um, uh, fraud, essentially, they're able to sort of invalidate those state transitions. And after the, the, the period uh, happens, they the, these um, transactions get committed to Ethereum and the state sort of gets like set in stone because the, the, the finality that the, these transactions achieve finality on Ethereum. And um, currently these sort of scalability solutions have had to compete with all of the other applications on Ethereum, whether it's OpenSea, whether it's Uniswap, uh, whether it's like apes or any NFTs, right? And it's, it's gotten really expensive. And so the motivation for EIP 4404 is create a separate storage space for these uh, separate scalability solutions to post data to. And so now you'll have more data for these scalability solutions to post data to in which it will increase the supply of data to these rollups. And in turn, it will decrease the price that these rollups have to pay for data, which will in turn make the transactions on these rollups a lot cheaper. And in, in turn, make Ethereum cheaper as a whole because the, the security on these rollups is equivalent or, or virtually equivalent to Ethereum in their final state. Currently, there's a bunch of like technical um, um, sort of training wheels or like different they're like in a beta phase, right? The, the technology is not mature enough to, to run in a fully secure way, but it's still almost as secure as Ethereum. And so these rollups will now have provide provide a, a lot cheaper block space and then a lot cheaper like user experience for people, right? So instead of paying, um, I don't know, right now it's probably like 10 cents per transaction on Optimism, let's say. So after EIP 4844, this price would be reduced by a factor of like 20 to 30 X by current estimates. So it would be like less than a cent um, for a transaction. And that, that's like the, the general motivation for, for EIP 4844. Uh, if you want to read more, then I would suggest uh, go to the EIP 4844.com website, which is just a, a website built by the Optimism team and the Ethereum Foundation to, to sort of illustrate what, what the IP is about and what what are the current sort of drawbacks like what is what what are people building what are people focusing on in the ap uh, what's missing and things like that and as the number of transactions grow as well um, the transactions that are then being sent to l1 uh, it becomes cheaper because these trend the number of there's more number of transactions so then you send those more number of transactions to the L1. So it becomes just cheaper overall as the L2 protocol grows. Is, am I correct with that logic? Yeah. So there's two things you post to, to L1. You post the call data, well, so-called call data, which essentially updates uh, the, the, the state of the L2. Right. So the rollups work in a way where you have a smart contract on L1 and then a network, a uh, separate network. And the smart contract on L1 has sort of like a timestamp or, or like a current representation of the state on the L2. And in optimistic rollups, the way to update the state is that it needs to go through this like seven day delay period, uh, where in order to update the state of the rollup, it needs to go through a seven day period. And once the fraud prover hasn't found anything, then it gets updated and this state gets committed to L1. That's one thing that gets committed. And in the case of zero knowledge rollups, in order to, um, update the state, you need to pr provide uh, zero knowledge proofs or validity proofs, which using cryptography, you can prove that all of the transitions or all of the transactions have happened on, on a rollup are correct, cryptographically correct. And then if you provide this proof to a verifier on the smart contract on a one, then the smart contract is like, yes, this is a valid proof for all of the transactions that have happened on the rollup. Let me update the state according to the, to the current state of the network. So that's, that's, that's sort of like what you're committing to L1 and these things take up space on L1. And therefore, if you, if you increase the, the amount of space that you provide for these rollups, it will um, reduce the cost in turn. 
without well, sacrificing the, the centralization as much. What are the limitations with optimistic rollups? Because with that seven day delay, I can imagine that there's going to be some certain limitations and zero knowledge rollups just seem or zero knowledge proofs just seem a lot, um, a lot more practical um, for kind of today's use cases. So I, I want to hear your input on those limitations with optimistic mm -hmm. rollups. Yeah, so, so optimistic rollups, um, you, you have a delay on sort of like the, the finality of every single transaction. Uh, but there's no like big user experience drawback um, besides the fact that you cannot use the native bridge to bridge back to Ethereum uh, unless you wait for the period of seven days, right? So whatever amount of, of assets that you have on rollup, you cannot natively bridge back to Ethereum instantly on an optimistic rollup. That's like the biggest drawback in terms of user experience. For zero knowledge rollups, uh, it's instant, right? Like you can provide a zero knowledge proof that this is my balance on L2 and like all of the state transitions on the chain are valid and you can immediately withdraw to L1. However, on the other hand, um, optimistic rollups are a technology that uh, have, have have been here for a while. Um, the the Plasma the plasma um, sort of research group um, that was like kickstarted in Ethereum like around the early days, like 2016, 2017, they were, they were working on scalability solutions for Ethereum uh, since the early days. And essentially, this research group is what turned out to like find like the, the, the construction of optimistic rollups. And it's a technology that's been that's been out there for a longer time, so it's more mature, right? Like you have Orbitrum and Optimism that've been live for over a year, and everything is like out there. And another thing that they can do is like these optimistic rollups, the way that they're architected, or the way that they're like thinking about their system, is that you can replace um, the sort of the, the sort of mechanism in which you assure that the transition has been valid. So in the future, there's nothing preventing optimism from switching from from like optimistic proofs to, to zero knowledge proofs so that the bridge like is aware that these transactions are valid, right? Especially with optimism currently, they're switching to a construction called bedrock, which is a specification for the rollup. And this specification allows for switching these things. And I'm sure Arbitrum is working on it as well. Um, and ZK rollups are just a lot more immature in terms of the technology, whether it's the proving systems, like the underlying cryptography is immature, whether it's the, the security surface area, right? Like these systems are unaudited. They've never run in production at scale, uh, which is like scary for a lot of reasons, right? If there's a hack, then you lose funds, things like that. So, so there's a big surface area in both like cryptography, the systems design, all these things. So in order to get all of these things right, there's a bunch of like protections in place uh, to like ensure that like if anything bad happens, the the teams, the respective teams, can like uh, act upon these problems and solve them. Yeah, th thank you for that explanation. I think it helps a lot. Um, and I'm actually curious to get your thoughts on um, layer twos in 2023 because there's a lot of people that are very bullish on layer twos. I'm extremely mm -hmm. bullish on layer twos, and there's a lot of companies that have made. Um, great advancements and achievements, um, including the ZK Sync, Starkware, Starknet, etc., um, on Layer Two. So I want to get your thoughts on um, Layer Two's about you know about a zero sum game and why it's not a zero sum game for Layer Two's and why it's beneficial um, for some Layer Two's to acquire maybe market share um, today, but that doesn't mean that they're stealing market share from another layer to tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like in the end of the day, it's just different implementations and different sort of uh, primitives that they're using, different technologies, um, but they're trying to achieve the same thing. They're trying to scale Ethereum and competition is great. Like the amount of, um, the amount of like technological progress that has been done in the scalability space on Ethereum in the past two years has been like extremely remarkable. All these teams mostly collaborate with one another. There's no like, of course, like each of them, like ha ha has their own like responsibilities to either their shell holders or like token holders that they phrased against or these things. So th they have like a strong motivations to succeed, but they don't have a strong motivation to sort of like hinder the progress of other solutions. So like they mo mostly help each other. They like share research. They share knowledge. They compete against one another, and the, the cool part is just like they're all building technology that's open source for the most part, for all of them, right? Um, everybody benefits. And the biggest distinction for people, I guess, would be the types of applications that are on them. Few users will ever care about like what cryptographical primitive is actually securing this, these networks or like 
that the infrastructure that, that is running it. Um, so they're, they'll mostly care about user experience. So like whichever rollup has like the best apps, the best integrations, the most flawless user experience, the best ecosystem, um, good developers, an easy to use programming language for developers so that then developers are motivated to build more applications and things like that. Uh, and I feel like all of them have a great incentive, right? Like there's there's um, there's rollups that are trying to go the EVM route where optimistic rollups are just better fitted for this, where they use just the traditional EVM um, where like Optimism and Arbitrum, you can write smart contracts using Solidity or Viper or any other EVM language. Uh, for zero knowledge rollups, it's a little bit more tricky to use the EVM because um, currently there's no production system that runs uh, zero knowledge proofs of EVM state transitions. It's really hard to build, but there's many teams like Scroll, like Polygon Zero, Polygon Hermes, um, or like uh, ZK Sync that are trying to do different different approaches to to doing a ZK EVM. Then there is um, things like Cairo or Sway, uh, right? So like Starknet is a is a zero knowledge rollup built by uh, the Starkware team, and they're using Cairo, which is a programming language that's uh, specific to zero knowledge, uh, a ZK DSL, if you will. Domain specific language, and and they are not compatible. And they're not uh, they're not EVM. EVM compatible. No, but there, there's also like other things, right? Like you can write an EVM in Cairo, and then in turn, like you can create a Cairo proof for an EVM state transition, and then the prover creates a Cairo proof. So like there's like experiments in which you can possibly build a zero knowledge rollup on top of Starknet, and then prove recursively to Starknet, and then. Starknet proves it to Ethereum. Like there's so many, the, the design space for these scaling solutions is so big that I feel like we're gonna see like a huge amount of progress in the next few years. And the state of the art is gonna look so different. Um, like there's new papers in cryptography coming out all the time. There's new implementations, there's new audits, there's new advancements. All these things like are very, um, like they're, they're just moving, moving parts everywhere. So I feel like Nobody knows which one is specifically going to win right now. So as a user, I would just recommend use use whatever um, you're interested in, like whatever like has nice applications on it. Of course, like make sure that it's like audited, that it's secure. That's like one of the main ones. I recommend uh, going to L2Beat for like doing risk assessments. L2Beat is like this um, dashboard that shows you sort of like how much TVL is on each network, how secure they are, what sort of security guarantees uh, they're providing. What security guarantees they're not providing, like how risky it is. You can go through the risk view. You can like see what bridges uh, you can use to like go across networks and how secure those are. Um, this is like a really useful tool for users to like evaluate the risk of using each of these rollups or scalability solutions in general. So to, to summarize, kind of on the point of the zero sum game, I mean, I think it really comes down to the client interfaces. Um, the developers are going to be the ones that are going to be building on top of these layer twos. Um, and these different layer twos are providing different types of functionalities for developers and development teams. Um, mm -hmm. And for the end consumer, they may not even know which layer two they're working with unless they're specifically going to that ecosystem to go and search for those apps. Um, mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, the, the user doesn't and is probably not going to know which layer two they're using um, unless they specifically search um, and find out that they're using that layer two. Is that correct? And in, in the mid term to long term future, yes. Uh, right now, the user experience of these blockchains or of the applications built on top of these blockchains is nearly not nearly seamless enough to make this abstraction robust and seamless. So you will find out because like these applications are not made for the average consumer yet. So you do need to know like how to use MetaMask, how to switch across networks, or how to use Rainbow or any like custodial wallet. So there's this issue, right? Like this is still like being fleshed out. Uh, but in the midterm to long term future, there's going to be so many scaling solutions and so many applications across a variety of networks. And each is going to have like different incentives to build on whatever network they are on. But it's positive sum for everybody. And so application, develop like application developers or like blockchain developers 
they'll have an incentive to support different networks if, if they have, and if they're not, they'll just build abstractions that make it easy for users to use and not have to worry about the back end of it. Yeah, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. One thing that really fascinates me about decentralization in general um, and decentralized applications um, is monetization. Um, I think a lot of people love the values of decentralization. However, there has to be an inherent way to make money for a lot of these applications in order to sustain the protocol, in order to sustain the people that are working on the protocol. And I feel like if you get too far down the decentralization rabbit hole, then there is not enough incentivization mechanisms for people to continue to work on the project. Um, mm -hmm. Lack of investors, lack of money to fund the developers. How do you see um, protocols monetizing good models for protocols um, monetizing and um, like four layer twos because we were just on this conversation how are you seeing layer twos um, currently monetizing and if they're not how do you see them monetizing in the future yeah so most l2s the the current like the only current um or the the two only current sort of revenue streams or just like money streams in general is either one the token right there is a token allocation to the whatever the foundation that they are on, right? Like, or for example, like Starkware raises money against a bunch of companies that led their series, and Starkware has allocation for these tokens. And uh, once these tokens are publicly tradable, then there's going to be like some economics backing the token, um, and there's like some value accrual to the token, or whatever, whatever use case inside of governments, whatnot. So there, there's the token, right? Like they can only always like buy and sell the tokens to sort of fund the treasury and fund development and do whatever they want with it. Or they have money they raised from investors. That's one route. And the other route is sequencer fees uh, that I see. Like That's like the most straightforward one right now. Um, right now, if you want to do a transaction on, on layer twos, all of these sequencers are run by the teams themselves. Um, they're not like permissionless sequencers. It's not like on Ethereum where you can run an execution node and run these transactions yourself. Uh, there's usually a central entity with whether it's like Arbitrum or Optimism that run these sequencers, it's mostly because it's too early. It's not because they don't want to decentralize, it's just the technology is not mature enough to do so. And yeah, so, you, have, you have to have a level of centralization at first when you're building yep. out a decentralized protocol so you can move quicker. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Also, like, sec the security is a huge issue so far. Um, so, like, if there's a problem, you need to address it quickly and you don't want loss of funds. That's the last thing you want to want to do. And so um, sequencer fees, right? If there's transactions happening on the network, these transactions cost some form of money, but there is always surplus. Um, there's some fixed base cost, which is how much these rollups are paying to Ethereum for security. Uh, so that's like a net expense for these rollups, but whatever is there left, they can use as revenue. Um, there's different approaches to this. Um, I, I believe like Starkware, the, the sequences that they've run for either StarkX, which is their Validium sort of product that they do, uh, things like DYDX or the current iteration of DYDX or Sorare for the applications, these, these sequencer fees go to Starkware directly. Um, and that helps in turn finance like development and whatnot. Uh, but there's like approaches like Optimism where uh, they do um, this thing called retractive public goods funding where excess uh, sequencer fees go to public goods and they go just, they, they're sort of funded in using quadratic funding. So like a similar mechanism that Gitcoin uses or is basically the same one where people can vote on which uh, protocols this money goes to and then it gets distributed to the ecosystem, right? So it's like whatever surplus thing, but th th then you have like more building towards the future and like trying to sort of like support the ecosystem, but you have maybe like less revenue it's, it's still unclear how they're going to monetize, but I feel like it's easy to monetize once you have users. That's, that's sort of like a really, especially in financial applications, you can just turn a fee revenue on, like let's say Uniswap. Like if Uniswap wanted uh, people that hold the Uni tokens to make money, they could do it tomorrow. There's just like a bunch of legal implications for doing so. And so it's just like trying to balance all of these things. But so far, I feel like the, the biggest or the, all, the biggest one and probably only one for most teams is just the money that they raised uh, against investors that helps finance these projects for the for the current uh, periods of time. But in the future, there's different schemes that you can do, whether it's sequencer revenue or provers or like verify, like, just like different types of architectures you can build. Yeah, uh, or I, like, I, just find it a, yeah. I just find monetization a fascinating topic because I don't think there has been 
um, really any protocols that have figured out the perfect monetization model and what that looks like. I think I think everybody's exploring it, and I think it's a very important topic that um, is getting brushed aside. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I am trying to kind of get to um, a point where a lot of these um, different individuals that I'm talking to um, come up with some ideas in order for in order for us to just have an open discussion about it because um, it seems like in the decentralization space everyone kind of brushes that off and um, I think it's just important overall for protocols um, to look forward and to really make sure that there is a way to to monetize and you know it's not for the, the, the for just the founders but it's just for the overall protocol and I think it's an important topic that should be discussed within the community I don't I don't think it's something um, that's a negative thing within a protocol um, and it, sh it shouldn't be looked at as a negative thing I think uh, monetization for any protocol is going to help the protocol survive grow um, and is going to allow it to kind of fund itself in order to make the protocol better yeah I definitely agree um, we definitely need like more economists in this space um, that are able to sort of create incentive structures um, like I feel like the biggest like revamp in terms of like um, economics inside of crypto has mostly been two things. One is proof of stake and the other one is EIP-1559, which have created very sound economic structures for Ethereum itself. I feel like Ethereum is now sustainable long term based of like of its current free revenue system. And like with the burn of assets, creating a deflationary supply and like things like that make Ethereum sustainable long term. But for applications, I haven't seen uh, a single like long term sustainable model. There's probably good bets. There's like things like the the, the Uniswap Treasury, the Ave um, sort of way of doing things. Uh, there's like a bunch of teams that are trying really hard to make these protocols like long term sustainable, and they have huge treasury, so they have time to like figure out like a proper solution. Yeah. So there's nothing pressing them, but there's definitely some. It's definitely something that's been put up by the side a little bit, but because there's a lot of more pressing issues, things like censorship resistant, like trying to like come up with like how to solve like MEV or trying to like cater to problems like this because MEV is also a potential revenue stream for a bunch of these applications yeah. or for blockchains in general or users this is a bunch of different things um yeah let's just it's an unexplored space or it's like it's, it's explored but there's so much work to do moving forward yeah and like the, there are some protocols that you know that are monetizing as you mentioned Uniswap um, OpenSea, OpenSea is kind of a bad example because they're a centralized application. Um, like DYDX, um, they're monetizing on transaction fees. Um, so, so there are applications doing it. Um, however, it's you know it's it's not inherently um, understood on kind of what the next steps are for a lot of these protocols. Um, mm -hmm. One of one of them um, just on on Bankless recently, Farcaster. Um, and I mean, he, he did talk about some potential monetization models in terms of a subscription based fee. And I think that's, I think that's interesting. I think that may be more prevalent in web three, um, as time goes on. And I think we may start seeing a little bit more of that, um, for, especially for the people who, um, who are using a protocol consistently and they're, um, it's not like they, they want to see advertisements and that's how protocols are mm -hmm. going to monetize because I think we all know and understand now like advertising, um, you know, it, it is a good sustainable model for businesses. However, it's just annoying, right? When you're on Twitter and you're seeing a bunch of ads, like that to me is annoying. I'd much rather just pay um, another extra eight dollars for the for the Twitter premium in order for me not to see any of those ads because I spend a lot of my time on Twitter and that's where I get a lot of my information. Um, so mm -hmm. I think it's kind of going to be a similar concept to that where you know we'll see a lot of quote unquote SaaS based models um, within the protocol space. Yeah, um, for me I think there's going to be like a more of like a hybrid solution where people will have optionality. Like you can use this protocol if you own X amount of tokens, let's say, or you can use this protocol if you pay a monthly or yearly um, based fee, or you can use this protocol if you share some data with us so that we can market things for you. Right? Like you can you, also like I feel like ads are not a bad model. It's just the current implementation of ads is very privacy invasive and it's business focused. It's not user focused. You do not own your own data. You just like, in order to use these applications, you have no other thing to do, but give us all your data. And you don't really know like how that data is used. Exactly. Uh, and it's very intransparent. But let's say that you can use the power of cryptography and you can do uh, zero knowledge proofs on different things. You can do like proofs on your interests. Like you can say like, all oh, like my interests are whatever based on my activity. And the advertiser knows that that's your interest. 
because they have like a zero knowledge proof based on some activity you've done. You can do like proofs of activity. And then eventually those advertisers can monetize or like they can like run ads. Because like in the end, you also want sort of like as a business, I guess, like ads is a, like a useful, a really useful sort of primitive. Um, I feel like it's also like not all bad, but it's definitely the implement the current version of it. It's 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 almost dystopian in which like your data gets easily compromised, and then if like these businesses that own your data um, get hacked, then it can easily like become part of like a scheme where people are selling data across the internet, and then like these all these like other marketing teams like get get data and like it's very privacy invasive. Yeah, and you're you're absolutely right. I mean, I think advertising advertisements. Uh, can be great as long as you know they're helping consumers find the products that they need. Um, yes. And one of the things that I've seen, um, for example, with TikTok influencers, they incorporate some of these products within their videos rather than trying to um, make the sponsorship uh, separate to the video itself. For example, like pausing within the video, they incorporate that into the video and it has the same values as them. Um, and that kind of makes it, you know, it makes it a lot more cohesive overall um, because it goes with their values and it makes it a part of the video. So it's just a lot more natural. And with Web3 protocols, I think you can do the same. You know, if you were, whatever you're searching for, if you're, you know, a DeFi degen, if you're an NFT degen um, and you're looking for analytical tools, I think there's ways to advertise that and do it in a way where you're helping out the consumers pick out these different options without it being invasive. And if they choose to pick you, it's not because, you know, you paid more, but it's because you have a better value proposition and you were there at the right time because, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of saw that on-chain data. Um, but again, you offered a solution for the problems that he was looking for. Yeah, I very much agree. Um, I'd like to, if you have a few more minutes here, I know we're mm -hmm. running up on time. I'd like to talk about a little bit about account abstraction um, and why it's super, uh, super discussed right now within the Ethereum community and why it's important. I mean, account abstraction has been discussed since 2016, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. It hasn't been yet implemented. I know a lot of the layer twos are incorporating it uh, into the layer two itself and trying to resolve some of these problems. But why is account abstraction so important or so, so important? What is it um, and what possibilities is it opening up for um, Ethereum and the blockchain, blockchain space in general? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so myself personally, I'm not that familiar with account abstraction, but I'll try my best to like give like a high level overview. Account abstraction allows you to do abstract validation logic for transactions. It essentially like, Currently, Ethereum has a limitation for what you can call a valid transaction. It needs to have a valid nonce, it needs to have some valid call data, like a bunch of valid properties. And that's what constitutes a valid transaction. But you cannot do arbitrary logic for, for what it, an arbitrary transaction might look like and what a valid transaction might look like. And account abstraction would be sort of like a framework in which you can build this like abstract validation abstract validation logic for these transactions. Well, I, think, I think one of the things maybe um let's say like an account like you have you have you have a netflix account um as a parent um and then you're able to um kind of have these sub accounts and if i understand kind of your your example correctly you have the you have these sub accounts which then you're kind of able to unlock different capabilities for these different sub accounts um for them to view um certain types of content um so instead of having just one type of um, one type of account and basically one type of transaction um, account abstraction is allowing you to um, have different capabilities different functionalities all within um, essentially one type of wallet and um, that one type of wallet acts as a smart contract where mm -hmm. then you can allow it um, for example you can allow a different person to send funds on your behalf um, yep. You can allow um, maybe different devices to access your funds. So you don't have to have um, different types of wallets on different machines or, um, or you know, even using your like cold wallet you have, that's where you store most of your money. But um, at the same time, now you can allow um, this like third device that where if you're sending, you know, a lot of money from now you can unlock that specific device 
to send that money at that particular time because you're making a transaction, let's say for a house. Um, but then you kind of lock the uh, the permission for that third device um, after you send that money, if I understand correctly. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, th I think that's right. Um, I mean, there's there's other things like the the, the other district this distinction is that um, there's two types of wallet generally speaking on Ethereum. There's this thing called an externally owned account, which is just a, a normal account you can generate using your private keys on top of Ethereum, and just you get a public key and you can sign transactions. And the other type of account that you can have is a smart contract wallet. But these smart contract wallets um, are limited in terms of what they can do because they're not externally owned accounts. So they cannot tap into some like native, native features of Ethereum. And so this would allow essentially for smart contract wallets to do things like sign in with Ethereum, where it'd be able to sign in um, to applications and recover your sort of profile on these, on these applications let's say using like things like guardian angels, um, which is like a concept introduced um, by the Argent wallet where you have like uh, a set of users that if they sign a specific message, they'll, they'll, they can help you recover your account or you can do things like uh, just like general sign in with Ethereum to any application. So in the future, instead of using your email and password, you can just use your, your private key to log into any website. Um, you can do things like uh, native multisigs uh, or multi multi-signature uh, wallets, essentially, in which um, a few users have to sign up uh, on a, sign on a, a specific transaction for, in order for it to happen. Or you can pay gas fees for other users uh, instead of using uh, things like meta transactions currently. Uh, that's, that's something that we do, for example, at WorldCoin, where um, each transaction that happens on the WorldCoin wallet, we subsidize it. But it's not a native subsidy. It's, it's using meta transactions, which is not really a native feature of Ethereum, and it's quite expensive. Um, that's why also like we use Polygon because it's it's it's, it's not an L2, it's not a rollup. It has its own security um, guarantees, but it's nearly not as secure as Ethereum. But things like account abstraction would allow to create a lot better user experience for wallets, um, especially yeah, for we, smart we contract actually, wallets. We, we actually do the yeah. same with PIA. I mean, we we pay for all of the. Uh, consumers to transfer their NFTs out of the quote-unquote shadow wallet to their own native wallet um, and obviously it's you know I, I think most companies should do that um, in order to onboard users from web 2 to web 3 because I mean inherently a web 2 user is not going to have Matic in their wallet they don't they're not even going to have a wallet and for them to get Matic um, that's a whole headache in itself. Yeah, Sorry for the yeah, interruption. Definitely, yeah, that's definitely true. Um, I just pulled up uh, an article written by my friend Cami about account abstraction. It's called Account Abstraction for Everyone Else. And if you search it on Google, I'm pretty sure it, it pops up. Account Abstraction for Everyone Else um, by um, Cami. I guess it's on her Substack, so you can you can probably find it through Google. Absolutely. And she she, she lists uh, a bunch of a bunch of use cases. Um, so one is like social recovery of wallets. That's what I meant, like the guardian, guardian angel type thing mm -hmm. where people can sign off and then help you recover your account. You can batch transactions. Uh, so instead of um, doing separate calls for separate transactions, you can batch them and then do one call um, for a variety of transactions and you can put them all together and pay once for the gas fee and then the execution fee. Then you have applications that can pay gas for um, their users. That's what we're talking about, meta transactions, but natively. Um, you can use wallets from different ecosystems um, that use different signature schemes, right? So like Ethereum uses ECDSA signatures, but let's say that some other scheme uses like BLS signatures, um, which are aggregated signatures. So that would help like make Aggregation, aggregation, like signature aggregation, easier for wallets. Uh, walletless Web3 login. That's what I mentioned about signing with Ethereum. Users don't need to e to to use ETH for their wallet to initiate transactions. That's what you mentioned, where they can pay like gas fees using a different token to initiate transactions, and it can automatically like be sold into ETH on the back end, and that's what sort of initiates the transaction because you have this abstract logic for. It for initiating a valid transaction. 
And it also allows you to put 100% of your funds in a multisig and initiate transactions from there directly instead of having to use an external owned account for specific things and then multisigs for the rest. Yeah, so that's sort of like a good summary. But if you want to read more about account abstraction, I recommend that article. It's really nice. Yeah, absolutely. I think everyone should read about it. I think there's definitely going to be a huge number of use cases that come out of this. And I'm very excited to see where this goes, um, especially with the protocols that are building it, building it in natively. Um, uh, and eventually when it does come to Ethereum, um, I think it's going to be one of those things that um, creates a huge amount of use cases that um, we're not even thinking about right now. I definitely agree. Um, I, I want to kind of finalize with a, f a few final questions um, mm -hmm. about yourself and um, kind of your experience and your thoughts in the world. Um, first off, I mean, what, what was your most memorable moment of 2022? 2022 obviously had its ups and downs. Um, so, so want to get your, get your input on that. For me, 2022 was mostly a year of exploration where I didn't really know what I wanted to do starting the year. And I made it my goal, um, to just like explore the space, try different things, different like types of blockchain developments uh, or like research and try and see what was the most fun. And eventually I stumbled upon WorldCoin and WorldCoin showed me a bunch of cool challenges in cryptography and and zero knowledge and engineering and different things that are that I found really interesting. So I feel like just just traveling and exploring and then eventually finding out what I'm really interested in and want to dedicate more time in is is not specifically like a moment, but it's sort of like what what sort of characterized my my last year. For for memorable moments, there's a few, but I really liked like traveling around. My favorite conferences were like Def Connect in Amsterdam, uh, Def Con in Bogota, um, ETH Berlin, a bunch of others. ETH Prague, ETH Prague was really nice because I helped organize it, and is like in my home country. And a lot of my friends from from the crypto space went and visited my country, and like it was really nice hanging out in the city. And you so got I, to I feel like around. yeah, yeah, it's, it was really nice. So ETH, ETH Prague probably was a good highlight. That's awesome. Yeah, I've been to Prague. It's absolutely beautiful. Highly recommend to anyone that's going to Europe to visit Prague. Yeah, same. What, what kind of impact do you want to have on the world? And if there was one goal that you could achieve in life before uh, you die, what would that be? Um, so like, since I was a kid, one of my biggest drives was to help people. Uh, I have an inherent love for people in general. And like for me, like it was mostly about like trying to find an intersection in between things that I like things that I'm somewhat good at and I enjoy and things that could help people. And I feel like since I started my journey, like whether it was ML or crypto, these technologies sort of embody the values that I find helpful, for, helpful to society and something, something that is important. Um, so the impact I would like to have is just you use these core technological primitives to build either more technological primitives and protocols or just in general, make an impact either directly or indirectly by helping people build tools with these with these things by either helping learn, um, the, like helping teach developers how to use them or just build applications that in, in turn have a positive impact. Uh, that's also like one of the reasons why I joined WorldCoin. I feel like it's one of the most ambitious uh, goals in the entire space. And the team is really, really amazing and they have a really good shot at achieving the things that, they, that they, they've set out for. Um, so I feel like just giving people more um, possibilities of what they can do with, with, with their life, like what they can do in terms of um, applications they have access to, whether it's financial or, or non-financial, giving them access to, to more, to a better life essentially. Through, through technology. That, that's a good summary. Yeah, that's very inspiring. And I, I fully agree with you. I think um, one, one of my goals in life is to be able to um, give others the capability that, um, that I had um, when I came to the United States, because I'm an immigrant myself, um, and give others just the ability to, um, to have kind of the same options that I had um, mm -hmm. and to, to have um, the opportunity to kind of do whatever they want to if they put their mind to it. 
Um, mm-hmm. So you know, eventually, when um, when I kind of get to a point of where I think I am able to um, provide, you know, back to the people that um, that one that helped me out, um, and to provide to people that I don't even know but might need that opportunity. Um, those people might most people those people might be the ones that actually impact the world so i think it's mm-hmm. very important to help um everyone even if you don't know them um because you never know um what the next person is going to do um and what kind of impacts they're going to have yeah yeah for sure like I, I myself like i'm 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 czech but i'm only like biologically half czech i'm also like half cuban and so i have a big part of my family is in cuba and like the the, the I've been there twice and just like seeing the the lifestyle that even is even possible like imagine for you since you're born you're you're severely limited by your surroundings like the aspirations you can have the things you can do are very limited there, there's barely anything you can do in terms of the compared to what a person that has global global limitations not just local country limitations and I feel like just through these tools we can we can level the playing field for everyone yeah and that's that's one of the things that i find extremely interesting um when you go to a country i mean like like a cuba or like a belarus um you you kind of see really what's going on and um you start to think like how can people live in such an environment but when you come from there um, and you come to a country like the united states you realize your options are really unlimited and you don't take things for granted um, like people do in this country, um, you really try to make it your all to um, to get to where you want to be in life or to aspire to your goals because you see that there's no limitations. You see all of these mm-hmm. different examples of Elon Musk, Larry Ellison, um, you name it, that have achieved these amazing feats that you wouldn't even even have thought would have been possible. Um, and I think just providing that sense of Um, that sense of possibility that things are possible um, to those people in in third world countries. Um, It gives them a lot of hope and it changes their mindset on what they can do. Um, And, you know, I think that in itself is just a great step in the right direction. Um, So I'm I'm trying to do my, um, play my role into educating um, the people that I can to to show them that, you know, whatever they want to do in life, they can accomplish it and they're not limited um, by their geographical location. And um, they they should um, at least do whatever they can to um, to, to kind of uh, figure out a way um, if they are in a challenged position, um, such such as their geographical geographical location, uh, to um, to get to a place where they can accomplish their goals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I want I want to finish off That's here amazing. on uh, yeah I want to finish off here on, on a on a po- on a positive note in terms of friendship. Um, you've been to a lot of great conferences um, over the past year. Um, mm-hmm. And you've met a lot of great people. What do you define um, as a great friendship? Um, and with all of the people that you met, how do you um, stay in touch with good friends? And how do you differentiate between acquaintances um, and good friends? I, I feel like there's, there's, there's the, mo- most of the people that I've become friends with in the past year are have the same interests that I have. So it's like a, it, it makes it a lot easier to get in touch with those people for me. Um, because like if, if they're in the Ethereum ecosystem, then most of them have the, the same values that I do in terms of like trying to use these technologies for the better, for helping different things. They have a na- na- like natural um, sort of inclination towards technology, which is a big part of my life as well. And so like who, who is a good person for me is like if, if I meet them, they, there's a certain type of vibe to a person that I meet. And um, just from interactions between them, just like how, how much you laugh with them, how much you, you enjoy the, t- the time you spend with them, uh, what you get to learn from them, just, just in general, how they make you feel, what, what, they, what, they, what they do, um, all of those things. I've met a lot of good friends. We, we usually stay in touch by either seeing each other at conferences We've also like a few of our a few of my friends have moved together to to Lisbon. So like a few of the friends that that uh, we wanted to be together and like hang out, we just decided to move to the same city. Uh, we're trying to get more more friends here as well. That's amazing. So that's like that's that's one way. The other way is just like Telegram. So we we often just like talk over Telegram. We message each other like things that are how how are things going. Then there's like Twitter friendships. Um, during COVID, I didn't have 
many in-person friends. I had just quit university. There was barely anything to do. There was a lockdown. I barely left my house. I lived in a remote village in Eastern Czech Republic, nothing to do there. Um, so like most of my friends were either on Twitter or in Discord. And so it's just like having that sort of support group of people that have the same interests, whether it's like anime or or technology or Ethereum or, or doing different things. Uh, I felt like that was really helpful. So just like have a lot of Twitter friends and just reading the timeline feels like reading like about what they're doing, which is fun and cool. And you get to like talk to them over DMs and stuff. That's really nice. Or like do watching sessions. Shit, like you have a specific posting. show. Yeah, ship posting is fun, <laughs> for sure. That, that, that was like my biggest pastime during during 2020, 2021. Not not as much last year because I was traveling a lot and I was like talking to a lot of people, so I was less on Twitter. But but yeah, awesome man. Well, thank you so much, man. Incredibly inspiring, inc- incredibly insightful. Um, I think this conversation was great. Um, you're killing it in this space, um, and I I really wish the the best for you and um, what you're working on. I think you have a um, you know, you're, you're a very, very passionate individual. And I think you have um, a long road ahead of you of um, many accomplishments and uh, many things that you're going to do um, for decentralization, for Ethereum, um, and for the different applications that are built on top of Ethereum and a lot of these layer twos. Um, so we appreciate your service um, overall and appreciate what you're doing um, in this space. And how can people find you? How can people contact you? Um, How can people uh, see what you're tweeting about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for those kind words. That that really means a lot to me. Uh, It's it's really like what I'm here for. Try to like help people, try to build useful things. And it's also like the curiosity just drives me a lot. It's it's really nice. Like it's it's really entertaining to learn more about cryptography, build these things. It's really fun as well. Um, In terms of like where where people can find me, it's mostly on my Twitter, at the DC build 3R. Um... Uh, yeah, that's where I'm most active. The same handle on Telegram if you want to send me a DM. It's easier to reach me there. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And again, it was a pleasure. Uh, fantastic conversation. And I look forward to seeing you around the crypto space. Likewise. Thank you very much. Have a good one. Thanks, buddy.